name is Carter Spawn. I'm the president of the Hampton Sydney chapter of the Alexander Hamilton Society. Uh, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with the organization, the AHS is a bipartisan nonprofit organization that seeks to launch young men and women into careers of foreign policy and national security. Excuse me, imbued with the Hamiltonian perspective of strong and principled American leadership on the world stage. The Hampton Sydney chapter is one of over 60 chapters nationwide, uh, ranging from Harvard all the way to the West Coast. Uh, the Hampton Sydney chapter meets frequently at the AHS house down the road to discuss all manner of foreign policy topics, and then we hold one to two big speaker events like this a month. Uh, tonight's a little different than our normal. Usually we bring someone down to talk about a specific foreign policy issue. Two weeks ago we had Luke Coffey from the Hudson Institute to come and talk about uh, Arctic security and opportunity as the ice melts. Uh, but now, in face of an pres upcoming presidential election, vice president uh, debate this evening, and an extreme rise in global tensions over the last 24 hours, it's prime time to talk foreign policy in general as it relates to the election. Our guest speaker this evening does not really need an introduction here on the Hill. For everyone live streaming, we'll give you one anyway. Uh, the Honorable Dr. John Hillen is the James C. Wee Professor of Leadership at the Wilson Center here at Hampton, Sydney. And prior to taking this professorship, he served the college for two terms as a trustee and has been awarded a Doctor of Laws degree by the college, making Dr. Hillen a Hampton, Sydney man in his own right. Dr. Hillen was educated at Duke, which we will forgive him for, King's College in London, Cornell, and he holds his PhD from Oxford. A former Assistant Secretary of State, Dr. Hillen uh, is also a decorated combat veteran and is a national security expert who has published numerous books and articles on strategy, foreign policy, and national security affairs. Most relevant to, tonight, to, excuse me, to tonight's conversation, uh, he's been a foreign policy advisor for four presidential campaigns and numerous primary efforts. He's been the principal author of many notable foreign policy campaigns and uh, speeches. So without further ado, Dr. Hill, the lecture is yours. Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks everybody for coming out. Venable looks great. I love this renovation. Fantastic. Thanks, uh, Professor Eanes, for bringing your class out as well. And uh, for alums online, and Ricky, I think we've got decent sound for the alums online. Okay, great. I'm glad everybody could join us. We do a lot of fantastic things. I mean, we just drop solid gold on the Hill all the time, I think, in terms of some of the things happening around campus. So I think it's great that we can share sure at least this one you know, small bit with alums. Um, so I want to talk about foreign policy in the election. And uh, it's pretty current if you check the news on the way over. Okay, and it's not going to get easier. I'll, I'll, I hadn't planned to really say this up front, but I think it's not unreasonable to think we're going to be electing a wartime president. You know, we are at war, ask any of the the probably it was 15, 18,000 sailors that have been deployed in the Red Sea, almost on constant battle stations alert around the clock. The, the thousands we have in Syria and Iraq, Jordan, Israel, all over the place, let alone the, um, the effort that we're doing with allies uh, in another hot war in Europe and, and supporting Ukraine and also in, uh, in a ever heating up Cold War in Asia. So uh, we are not at war per se in a, in a technical sense, but I do think Americans need to think about electing a wartime president because the temperature is not gonna go down in the environment anytime soon. So I wanna talk about how to think through this. How do you think through this now five weeks before the election? Let me just give you three uh, overall, met, what I call meta thoughts, some opening thoughts, okay? Foreign policy is rarely the fulcrum on which an election turns, okay? It almost never is. And for those of you that, that need to leave for the vice presidential debate, it's slightly more important than whoever the vice president is, but not much, okay? Foreign policy is just not something that, that it turns on. But, okay, it usually ranks pretty high. In the latest Gallup polls, general national security concerns are about fourth, and then other foreign policy concerns are about fifth. And by the way, those national security concerns don't line up terrifically well across the spectrum. Um, the number one is China as an adversary, but not very uh, defined. And then uh, cyber, nuclear, terrorism, and then general instability, and especially as it leads to illegal immigration. 
Okay, those are the five big foreign policy topics that capture voters, but they don't start coming in until four or five. At the same time, we've always known throughout our elections that the ability of a presidential candidate to grasp, articulate, have a command of foreign policy, to be statesmanlike, stateswomanlike, right, is, is in the back of people's minds. It's like a background music for their stature as an American leader on the world stage, and then because of our own unusual constitutional provisions, the role of the president to serve as the commander in chief, as well as the commander in chief. I personally don't like it, I'm not, I don't know how David Marion feels about this, there are other great constitutional scholars here on the Hill. I don't like when we say we're electing a commander in chief, you're not electing a commander in chief. You're electing a president of the United States who has a, who has a secondary duty under the Constitution in Article Two to serve as the commander in chief of the armed forces when they're at war. Okay, people know that, it sits in the backgrounds of people's minds, so they may not care about foreign policy issues, but they do want to hear about in the election because it's a measure of the metal, M-E-T-T-L-E, the measure of the metal of the candidate in many ways. A second big meta thought I wanted to lay out, if I can get the clicker to respond there, is that almost all U.S. presidents run on a domestic agenda and come into office expecting to come on a domestic agenda. And guess what happens? They quickly become foreign policy presidents, okay? I think probably the most, um, in many ways, some, the most endearing and perhaps consequential of these stories is not the one that springs to mind, uh, you know, for, for us in this, current, in this current times, which is President George W. Bush, who ran at, as a compassionate conservative, had a big domestic agenda, and it couldn't have been more, um, evident in the fact that when the initial terrorism planes, with the planes full of terrorists hit the World Trade Center, he was reading to a room full of second graders in a school in Florida when the world turned. And you saw right there in that, in that scene, if you can think of it like a scene like from a movie, you saw the scene of, this is the world I came in to, to try to shape, now I'm in a different world. And it just flipped right there, right? I think back to Harry Truman, put on the ticket over a current sitting vice president in a sort of wild selection process in which nobody knew who was really in charge, certified at, a, at the 1944 Democratic Convention, and then 89 days later he gets called in his office at the Senate. He doesn't even have an office in the White House. He gets called in his office at the Senate, where as the vice president, he's the president pro tem of the Senate. Can you come to the White House? He gets to the White House and Eleanor Roosevelt greets him first and she said, the president is dead and you're gonna be the president. And he was sworn in and two days later, the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson says, I gotta tell you about this thing we're working on. And read him into the Manhattan Project, the entire bomb, and he had to take control of all that, right? Was not created to be a foreign policy president. So that just happens a lot in our history. I think that's got to sit in the back of America's minds, Americans' minds too, despite the fact we're almost going to entirely hear about domestic measures. Um, so a third big meta thought, okay, in case you haven't been reading the newspaper in the past two and a half years, these two candidates, whichever one wins to become president, will enter into a vastly different global scene than when they were last um, uh, you know, before the last election, before 2020. The world has dramatically changed in its national security complexions since 2020. So um, that's very, very different. And that's why I say, you know, we probably are electing a wartime president. Okay, so how should we think about this? And in the great spirit and, you know, the boss, President Stimpert, is only a couple of houses down, he likes to say, at Ham City, we don't teach you what to think, we teach you how to think. So I want to talk about ways about how we could think through foreign policy in the presidential election. So a couple of different ways. How do you understand what a candidate might do as president? Well, we can explore their political philosophy. Every politician has a political philosophy buried in there somewhere, even if they can't articulate it. And that political philosophy tends to betray about how they feel about the world, how they feel about its general uh, characteristics, about the role of America in that world, about the role of force, about what constitutes legitimacy, what constitutes sovereignty, how to best solve problems. These all pour out of a political philosophy or a worldview. Any German speakers in here? Of course, you gotta throw up this great word, Weltanschauung, 
you know, uh, kind of capturing a view of the world. So you can explore that. You can look at their track record, if they're experienced politicians who've had to make foreign policy decisions before, right? Maybe you can discern what kind of president they might be from their track record. So we'll take a little look at that. You can study what they're saying in their campaign. Okay, so they've got to talk about it. You can look at party, uh, you can look at their, their advisors and their advisors' views, right? So if you tell me a president is coming in with Henry Kissinger as advisor, that's all I need to know. I, got the, I know it all at that point, right? Because I know Kissinger's worldview. And if he's going to be influential, then uh, that's going to be the likely thrust of a presidential administration, right? So we try to discern, especially with presidents who don't have much foreign policy experience, okay? A President Harris would come in with more foreign policy experience than Clinton, George W. Bush, or Trump because she served as a senator on relevant committees. None of those three former presidents had it, okay? But um, uh, she's still gonna rely on advisors, so by exploring their ideas, can we discern anything about how a president might run foreign policy? We can look at the party platforms and the politics of the different parties, okay? That's another way. They have to say something about how they view the world, what they view about America's role in the world, what they view the role of the president should be within that. Okay, we can maybe, this gets a little softer, right? We can try to think, how is this person, remember Hillary Clinton used this line in running against uh, Donald Trump in 2016, and she had a commercial, the 3 a.m. phone call. Who do you want answering the phone at 3 a.m. when there's an emergency, right? It was a character test. It was a, what are your, what are your decision-making skills like in an emergency? What are your impulses? What are your natural characteristics? So you can try to discern that. Okay, and then you can just look at the opinions of all the experts. Okay, that's something else you go away. We call this the argument from consent in apologetics, right? We can look at what all the experts who study this all the time are saying and say, well, maybe, maybe the conventional wisdom's got something to tell us. All right, so explore a little bit of these. In the spirit of, um, and there's a lot of other ways you can do it too. You guys can come up with some because I want to, um, stop the talking bit by about 8.30 so we can get your thoughts. So you may have other ideas that, that kind of walk you into this question of what kind of president would they be on foreign policy? Right? That's the research question we're trying to solve tonight. Okay, let's look a little bit about the political philosophy thing. So, uh, you know, I teach strategy and so I love uh, two by two matrices. So I'm gonna use one here. And this is uh, pioneered by a friend of mine named Henry Now, who's a great scholar of um, international relations at George Washington University. He said you can basically think about the way um, administrations confront the world uh, by placing them on a, on a relative graph. Everybody has on this vertical scale, it kind of measures your ambitions as a country, as an administration. The more ambitious you are, you're at the top of the scale. He called that, you know, spreading democracy. The less ambitious you are, you're like, you know what the purpose of the government is to defend our stuff, right? And that's what we do. And let's not have any, if you go out there, that place is crazy out there, that world out there, right? Why should we go out there and try to get involved in a lot of things? We should stick to our knitting here at home. We've got this great big country, two oceans protecting us, two peaceful neighbors. Like, why are we looking? So in, in their most extreme versions, the defense security argument is not so much about security. It's about sort of staying at home and taking care of your business. And the spread democracy is about having a more messianic, a more idealistic, a more a, approach to getting out there in the world and trying to change it. Okay, so that scale measures what I'll call ambition in an administration. This other scale is a way of looking at the world. How do you think the world works? When you look at it, the world, do you see a generally peaceful place that lends itself to cooperation in which the best way to solve problems is putting people together in multilateral forums, you know, uh, like the United Nations, solving everything together, Consulting the Belgians when you have a difficult issue before you make a decision, right? This is the way people solve problems. We're sharing the global comments. That would put you all the way there on the diplomacy end of this spectrum. If you have a little bit more of a, of a realist type view about the world, you know, like everybody's out for themselves. People are always gonna take care of their own interest. You never know when you're gonna need to um, muscle down on somebody in some fashion, right? You're gonna have a view that pushes you more to to the left side of the spectrum as you're looking at it. 
And in general, as we, as we map the relative worldviews and approaches of administrations over time, we can see where they fall on this. We can also give these categories some labels. So, you know, conservative internationalism tends to uh, um, occupy that quadrant. A more liberal version, a more uh, neoliberal version of international on the other quadrant. Um, some scholars call this quadrant down here where you're more interested in staying at home and, and you have a more uh, realistic view about the world uh, and you're willing to use force to defend your interests, but you generally think people are not as cooperative as they might like to be. You have a more nationalist impulse. And then of course over here is you have a more pacifistic impulse. You think everybody can get along, okay? And it's a natural state. The natural state of things is people getting along. We don't need to go out there and force people to get along. Okay, we've given, uh, and then of course in the middle of the realist. You ask a realist what they believe, they only ever, a good realist only ever gives a two word answer. What might it be? Depends. It depends. That's right, that's a good realist. What do you believe? You know, it depends, right? What are you trying to get done? What does the playing field look like? Who else is on the playing field? What are my ups and downsides? That's the way realists think, right? So they're kind of there in the middle. We've given labels to these uh, schools of thought over the years. Here's, if you're, for you ornithologists, right? We have doves, we have hawks. Um, some political labels, neocons over the years and paleocons. If you're following, you know, the politics of things, globalist. We've, we've slapped a label on some of these um, schools of thought. And then one I like, which stems from, not from Alexander Hamilton's per se, but from my friend Walter Russell Mead, a great scholar of international affairs, is he said there's two, there's four schools of thought about the way the Americans have approached the world and thought about the world. And he named them after famous statesmen who kind of represented this school of thought. And the first school of thought was the Hamiltonians. Uh, they believed in leading with commercial power, uh, use it that the strength of the, the business of America is business, as Calvin Coolidge sort of said in a quote once, right? They believed in meeting, meet, leading with the economic strength of a maritime trading nation, which is backed up and bolstered by a military capable of enforcing rules that would allow us to prosper, not afraid to get engaged, Anybody, anybody seen the musical Hamilton? Do you remember the second cabinet debate about which, whether to get involved in the French the wars between France and England or the French Revolution or not? And Hamilton was like, no, we're staying out and we're gonna favor, ultimately favor the, the British, the British system in this, because he had an economic realist argument. Jefferson's argument in that was more passionate. We gotta stick with our revolutionary brothers and sisters. Right, Hamilton's like, no, 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 it's all about business, right? So that was the start of the Hamiltonian school of thought. It's evolved over the years into a much more robust school of thought, but Walter Russell Mead calls that the Hamiltonian school of thought. The Jeffersonians, conversely, are less ambitious about going out into the world and trying to change things, and more interested in, in taking care of issues at home. Okay, so that one lower on the scale of international ambition and activity, more interested in restraint rather than intervention. Okay, which is very much, you know, if you think back um, to, to the namesake of this school of thought, Jefferson's instincts up until he sort of activated the, uh, the Navy that John Adams started and sent him off to fight the Barbary Pilots. It was a very Hamiltonian move to activate a navy and send them across the world to fight the Barbary Pirates to protect economic and political interests. But we have modern Jeffersonians today who are a little more, uh, you know, uh, uh, less adventurous in their views about America's engagement in, in the world. The Jacksonians are also a little more restrained, but when they do act, they often like to use force. If you punch a Jacksonian in the nose, you're gonna get a cruise missile in return. Right, this is the Jacksonian philosophy. Um, they're not looking for trouble, but boy are they willing to bring it to you if you mess with them. Right, and this of course is named after Andrew Jackson, the school of thought. But, but they don't have crusading ideas about making the world a better place and trying to get everybody to get along and cooperating with everybody. We're gonna take care of our stuff, but we're gonna be really, you know, don't mess with us, is the Jacksonian school of thought. And then the Wilsonians. And of course, Woodrow Wilson held up here as someone who had, um, 
you know, I, I, I use the word messianic, a more messianic idea about how the U.S. could get out there and reshape the world, largely in its image perhaps, but reshape the world under some set of conditions. Now, if we map administrations, going back to our topic tonight, over the past 50 years against us, where do they sit down? So I would put the Nixon administration kind of right in the middle, your classic realist. Um, and, and by the way, you know, in the course of a long administration, administrations may bounce around a little bit. They don't stay in one place. Events change, opportunities present themselves. Uh, the Carter administration, which followed it, uh, more oriented toward diplomacy and less towards force, less willing to get engaged, especially in military adventurism. Reagan was a little bit the opposite. Reagan beat Carter in 1980 largely running on the idea that we needed to confront the Soviet Union in a more determined way and even rebuild the military in the middle of, if you thought we had bad inflation, you know, 1979, 17% inflation, everybody says, we got some people in here like me, old enough to remember this, right? These were awful economic times. Reagan comes in and says, I want to double the size of the military. Nobody was asking for an aggressive approach to the Soviet Union. There were not mass demonstrations out on the street saying we need to confront the Soviet Union in a more determined fashion. Um, uh, but Reagan ran on that platform and brought people along with them, but he was far more hawkish in general in his approach to the world uh, than Carter was. George H.W. Bush followed Reagan, the, the father, Bush 41, okay, really consummate diplomat, realist, not afraid to use force. I, you know, I deployed to a war, on that, as did uh, Colonel Boyer. I think Colonel, were you in Desert Storm? Colonel Eanes did, so a couple of us in this room under Bush as a commander in chief. Um, but on the other hand, he was pretty cautious um, and other things, so uh, a uh, good example of a realist. President Clinton came in, was a little more aggressive, a little more, uh, got his hopes dashed in Mogadishu, in which Hemp Sydney alum Matt Eversman fought in uh, the Battle of Mogadishu and in the movie Black Hawk Down, um, and also Haiti and, and the Balkans to some extent. So, you know, Clinton started a little uh, more aggressively and then and sort of retired back. George W. Bush would have been way down in the realist category until September 11th, 2001, okay, at which he became almost an example of the arch neoconservative, not because he responded to a terrorist attack, because ultimately the Bush administration reshaped, reshaped the goals of the interventions in Afghanistan and Iraq into more about nation building and leaving behind, uh, transforming the Middle East into a more peaceable democratic environment, transforming the countries in which we were engaged rather than a pure counterterrorism battle. So that put him way up on the scale of ambitions. Okay, and then you had Obama uh, came in here and uh, near Biden, and then Trump, uh, Trump as president, Trump won. We don't know if there will be a Trump two. Trump one was a very, uh, you know, nationalistic oriented presidency, right? Wanted to reduce commitments, not, not gain commitments. He still, uh, you know, boast on the campaign trail about not starting new wars, right? The first president to not start new wars. So his campaign then, his style of governance then, and his promise now is, we're not gonna get involved in more bad stuff. We're gonna do less bad stuff. This is actually the so-called grand strategy of the Obama administration. They said, they said, we're not gonna do stupid stuff. That was their, their quote, right? So there's, there's, a, um, there's a, uh, avoidance mentality sometimes if you're below that line, that, that horizontal line of ambition. Okay, so that's the way, so keep that in mind. I'm going to give you one other piece of looking at worldviews, okay, and this is, the, I think, one of the big backdrops where we are right now. Since World War II, there's been a general consensus, viciously fought over some of the details over the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. I'm not going to pretend that everybody was getting along throughout our diplomatic history over the past 75 years, but there was a general consensus about what the big thing was that we commit to in international relations and how we defined American interests. And they were generally evolved around these four pillars, okay? You hear this, this term, I don't like it, the rules-based international order. I say this is the American-based international order. We put it together after World War II, the economic arrangements and the security arrangements. 
and to, in some degree the political arrangements in places, and then we agreed to use our power to underwrite it and defend it. That system made us the wealthiest country in the world, still are by a long shot, and, uh, and it also made others wealthy, including fallen adversaries and future foes. China's own power rose as a result of these conditions so on. But we were, we, we were using our power to underwrite those conditions. We, we had a view that this should generally be done through alliances and partnerships, but more show alliances and partnerships we could control as opposed to something like the UN General Assembly, which we could not. And we were willing to go it alone if need be, but that wasn't the preferred solution. Right? Alliances and partnerships was a more efficient way to get things done. There was a general open-mindedness, the classic definition of the term liberal, not the way we use it politically these days, but an openness about this system. We're supposed to make political rights more open, not more closed. Economic rights more open, not more closed. Okay, and we, were, and we were seeking an openness in the world because it would benefit us and it would benefit the world to make, the, there was even a, a theory, the theory of the democratic peace that this would make the world a more peaceful place as well as not just good for America, free trade. People used to believe in free trade once upon a time. I know it seems like it's this myth from the past, uh, but uh, free trade was considered to be a pillar of this. And then finally, we're not ashamed to use power. When I got to Germany in 1989 as a young lieutenant, uh, there were 365,000 other American troops, you know, in the army, not just the other services, in central, in that part of Europe, in Western Europe, right? I mean, we were not afraid to have people everywhere doing things. We fought several wars around the world as a result of that, okay? So that consensus is fraying because of uh, events and, and the willingness of American power and, and its leaders to uphold it. When I look at the candidates, I see, I think Harris would largely keep the elements of that consensus, but leak out of it a little bit. Um, my analysis is that a Harris administration is gonna be less likely to wanna use force to up uphold these things. And you can see this in the writings of her advisors, I'll talk about it, okay? But generally, a, a, um, her approach stemming from a traditional consensus. Trump, much less so. And he proved this point in the first administration too. He's broken completely with the free trade agenda, so that's a big part of it. But he's also just, he's not of the system. So he's more willing to say, I don't, I don't know why we've been doing that for 30 years, you know? That doesn't make sense to me. So he's, he's more willing to break the system. He has no investment per se, intellectually. I, just, I, I could say he profited quite a bit, as all, did all Americans who did well in the past 75 years from the system, but he has no intellectual investment in it as a policy thing. So he's more willing to break for it. So he's more of a unconventional candidate. All right, I'm gonna make some quick points on these other things, but I, I think that's really important, especially for our students to have, like have some kind of mental map for how to think through this question, instead of just an opinion. Someone comes up to you at the Tiger Inn and says, on foreign policy, who do you like better? You're gonna have a thought, you're gonna have an opinion. You should have like a mental map and a rationale uh, for the defense of your opinion. And there's just some ways to think through it. Okay, so track records, how do we think about that? We've had it, uh, President Trump. So we can take from that, we can say we know how he might act as a president vis-a-vis -vis foreign policy. And a generally stable time, which he, which he you know, is, is, is something he's trying to bring out in this campaign, that a generally stable time in world affairs until the pandemic, okay? And he also had some very sophisticated uh, advisors around him. I've talked with all three of his, just in the past six months, probably at least a year for Bolton, I talked with all three of his former national security advisors, I know them all, Robert O'Brien, John Bolton, and H.R. McMaster. And, uh, and so he was surrounded, Mike Pompeo, he's surrounded by what I'll call really pro almost professional foreign policy thinkers. And so there was, uh, there was a, uh, if, if you don't look at the tweets, there was a stability and, and a, a continuity to his foreign policy presidency that, that I think most people would say on the surface had to would judge it a successful foreign policy presidency, okay? Um, Harris has uh, only served in a foreign policy role as part of the Biden administration. So now we have to, now we have to say, okay, what can we, what can we discern, what can we take away from a role as vice president? Because she's the presidential candidate now, they're making much of 
always the last person in the room, heavily involved in the um, in, in the debates over policy and all and all the rest of that. Um, but the vice presidency is generally not considered to be a pivotal, certainly not legally. It's not a pivotal role in most administrations. A lot of people, I was on the inside of the Bush administration. Cheney wasn't nearly as influential on President Bush and all the decisions happening around Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice and Don Rumsfeld and Bill Gates as conspiracy theorists would like you to think. Um, so vice presidents traditionally just play a, play a, a smaller role. Uh, but we could take some things away because she's been an active part of the, it, the administration. Uh, and she was in the Senate, as I mentioned in the Senate, she served on the uh, Intelligence and Homeland Security Committee. She, she went to Afghanistan, she went to Iraq. So she got foreign policy experience and that makes her you know, I already mentioned more experience than some of our recent presidents. So you can look at that. You can, uh, you can look at their campaign pronouncements, okay? The kind of things, I, I wrote some down, the kind of things you hear. Um, Trump is promising the biggest military buildup since um, uh, World War II, um, which I would argue even if he wasn't, Americans may want to think about. We're at the lowest percentage of military spending, both as a share of the federal budget and as a share of GDP in quite a long time. Uh, he's promising a revival of the defense industrial base. He's promising to use energy as a central component of national power. Um, he's promising to be less diplomatic with our allies and make them do their share. Uh, he's not afraid to promise a trade war. Uh, he's, got, he's promising to be tougher on Iran. He's promising to be tougher on China. So that's some of the things coming out of the campaign, less ideas. The Harris campaign is promising, and these are some words I plucked out from everybody, a less arrogant America, uh, a more restrained U.S. strategy, um, learn from past excesses. So there's still this Obama-Biden-like sense of we overdid it in Iraq and Afghanistan, and a president should, should restrain these interventionist impulses. Um, we should have lower ambitions. We should, we should have leadership, but without hegemony. That was an interesting way to express it. We should be leaders, but not try to dominate everybody else. Um, talk about the limits of U.S. power. Talk about the global commons. Um, uh, and so uh, they, they, there's, there's echoes. There's echoes in here of an Obama-Biden type approach. So what I, I'll call it almost a kinder, gentler you know, type approach to international relations. So that's what you see coming out of the campaigns. I think you have to be leery about campaign pronouncements because there's, and you're gonna see it in the debate tonight, right? You can throw out about 60% of what you see and it's just a line that really doesn't make a big difference, right? It's a campaign pitch, it's a campaign commercial. Um, so you've gotta decide yourselves. And this is where, you know, this is one of the things I love about the education we offer here. If you learn how to think, you can start to separate out. The, the signal from the noise um, in campaigns. Okay, so that's important when you're looking at that. Um, we also hear from, there's protectionist impulses on both sides that are coming out um, in the noise from the campaigns. Uh, I think the, the, the retrenchment is in the air from both candidates. Both candidates are not promising more intervention, more adventure, more difficulty. Very few people get elected promising that. Even in 1940, with London being bombed every night for months, okay, both presidential candidates ran on a platform promising to keep us out of the war, okay? It was only after safely reelected for his unprecedented third term that FDR had Congress put the peacetime draft bill on the floor. Anybody know how, how, how it passed? How, how close it was in passing in December 1940? Yeah, literally only one person. One vote, well and done. And, and after World War II started, she actually lost her seat. In exactly. So it was only, so yeah, it, it was very, very close. No, that was the declaration of war, where it was, there was one person voting against. The draft vote was, it only passed by one, one vote, right? Very unpopular notion in December of 1940. Um, so, president, we shouldn't read too much into this. Presidential candidates never come in saying, I'm promising you war and destruction, right? That's just not a good platform. So they're talking about retrenchment. They're talking about the U.S. kind of pulling back from the difficulties of the world. I think I've heard Harris definitely sounds stronger on support for Ukraine. She used 
some comments from the other side to kind of give herself a Reagan-esque portrayal the other day. I thought that was a good campaign move. Uh, and then Trump sounds a little stronger on support for Israel on the other side, and perhaps a little more equivocating on Ukraine. Um, how much can you learn from that? I don't know, right? I've seen people say things on campaigns and then they go away and it never matters again. Uh, okay, both campaigns have some things, they're both supporting a strong military, both conventions were very patriotic, and nobody has anything set bad to say about the military, both promised to be tough on China. So you can take that for what it's worth. Okay, we can look at their advisors and their worldviews. As I mentioned, there were a bunch of professional foreign policy types surrounding President uh, Trump in his first term. He's got a few left. My friend Bridge Colby is up there next to him and Robert O'Brien who may come down and speak on campus in the future, Mike Pompeo, but uh, for the most part he's just got people he trusts now and, and he makes his own decisions. Right, he takes his own counsel. So I don't think you get much out of reading it to the tea leaves of what. And I had a coffee with Clark, General Clark Kellogg uh, up there in the glasses, one of the advisors, and was probing him on this a couple of months ago. And I don't think you get too much out of it. Trump makes his own decisions. So I don't think that tells you very much. A little bit more, perhaps you might be able to discern a little bit more. So uh, uh, candidate Harris, right, not really experienced in the field. So this is her chief foreign policy now. She's a guy Phil Gordon. I worked with him twice. And, uh, and then his deputy is also, they're, they're, the, they're the key advisors for the vice president and now for the candidate. And these are some of the books they've written. Phil's written 11 books, so you know what he thinks, right? And, um, but anyway, his, Phil's latest book was about how, what a disaster getting involved in the Middle East has been for the U.S. since we helped with the coup in Iran in 1956. Was it 56? Yeah. 56, right? So, so his, his thing is, so that, there's a clear message of restraint there, right? And then his deputy, a woman named Rebecca Lisner, wrote with a, a book about an open world. We don't want a world dominated, we want an open world in which we, everybody can access the global commons and the U.S. helps make sure the rules are fair for everybody. So it's a very like leadership light. Remember Obama had this famous line, leading from behind he said in one of his speeches. So you see that philosophy pouring through in those echoes. So that's what you might learn from their advisors, okay? If you look at party platforms in politics, not much there. Platforms don't matter as much as they used to. I remember on some campaigns, we would have savage fights over which word got into the platform where and there, because we thought it mattered. We thought you could look back on that and say, this is what this party stands for. Now it really doesn't matter. Okay, they're a, they're a little bit more of an afterthought marketing document. Um, so they don't, they're not as important as they once were. What, what I think could be uh, instructive for a president is that their, their, their respective politics within their parties. This matters, domestic politics. Foreign policy decisions are never divorced from domestic politics, okay? Lyndon Johnson hid the cost and the obligation and the strategy in the Vietnam War until he could get his domestic legislation passed. And then he was trapped. He was trapped in a loop, right? FDR's chief of staff went over to, this is the Pentagon wasn't yet, went over to the old executive office, they talked to George Marshall in the fall of 1942 and said, you're gonna invade North Africa before election day, right? Because the midterms were coming up. And George Marshall, General Marshall said, well, I don't know, You've got, there's tides and boats and all these technical considerations. I don't know, it's, it's not a concern of mine. And the White House Chief of Staff said, it's a concern of yours. The president's gonna get slaughtered in the midterms and he wants American boys fighting the Germans before election day. Um, it didn't happen because of tides and boats and all the rest of it. And uh, the Chief of Staff went back to Marshall and chewed him out. It said, you cost the Democrats 40 seats in the midterms. Okay, Lincoln wasn't above domestic politics. Anyway. So it always matters. What are the likely points of pressure in this election? I think the progressive wing of the Democratic Party is gonna put uh, pressure on a Harris administration to, uh, to have a, a, a more nuanced, balanced view of, um, of support for Israel. Okay, and, and they're, gonna, they're gonna want uh, different voices heard in that. And I think, you know, because Trump does keep his own counsel, I don't think there's any wing of the Republican Party that really impacts his decisions. But he will have domestic considerations to have to consider. So that's something you can kind of think about and say, oh, no, does that make a difference to the way I think about things? 
Okay? Um, how can you gauge their instincts? Anybody here take my leadership class? Well, I keep calling it there, right? We talk in the leadership class about action logics. This is w w when you're under pressure, when you're trying to make the sale, when you're defending your turf, what's the dominant logic you use in your mind to win the day? Okay? A, a strategist says, let's do it my way, because if we do it my way, we'll be here by tomorrow, and if we're there by tomorrow, we'll be able to see there by Friday. If we're there by Friday, we can shape that next month. If we shape that next month, we can move there next year. That's the way a strategist explains their logic. And Achiever says, well, we need to be there by Friday because it's due Friday and we're supposed to be sitting there. Right? Short-term achievement. And there's all these different kind of action logics and temperaments. What is theirs? Okay, and I'll tell you why I think that's particularly important. And finally, you can weigh the opinions of the experts. There's a general narrative out there. I, I probably read 30 articles before this by the experts. Listened to, I have a three-hour drive back and forth every week here, so I listen to a lot of podcasts. And it's really interesting, there's two general themes out there. There's a general theme, rightly or wrongly, this is the perception. I don't have a judgment here. I'm telling you, it's out there. That Trump 2 would be like Trump 1, but because he's been president before, and because he thought he was a very successful president, and his foreign policy, I think, could be judged a pretty good success, that he's not going to need a lot of expertise around him. And his natural, his natural style will come to the fore. He'll be a little bit noisy and transactional and impulsive, but ultimately he'll view American interests pretty narrowly. And he said that pretty clearly in the debate. He said, look, at the end of the day, Ukraine's always closer to Europe than it is to us. We'll be there, we'll support them, but the Europeans gotta do their bit. That's a, that's a narrower view of American interest than get out of the way, America's gonna lead, you know? Um, so he's gonna view the world that way. And then there's a general view that Harris would be, and as, as I mentioned before, this kind of softer, less messianic um, version of a multilateralism. But here's uh, my bottom line, and then we'll get your thoughts. Um, Lincoln said this in 1864, President Lincoln. He said, I claim not to have controlled events, but confess plainly that events have controlled me. Okay, so I want to quote a very famous strategist, the great Mike Tyson. Okay, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Okay, I think that is going to be the dominant shaping force of the foreign policy we get from the next president as opposed to a lot of um, nifty analysis about the way they feel about the world and even if they had a strong view about the world how willing they're, they're going to try to shape the world to their impulses and their instincts. Okay, I think like Lincoln confessed given the state of the world we're in and given that both these candidates don't have strong views, they don't have like well-developed Statesman like views where, where they want to see a certain kind of world a certain way and they're willing to put a lot of energy and power into it. Uh, so it's not quite events writing themselves on a blank slate, but it's closer to that than a president com coming in promising to shape the world a certain way. I think we're going to be uh, just have to deal with events. Which when um, British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan was asked about the most difficult thing about his job as the Prime Minister, he said events dear boy, events. So I think we're in much the same state. Okay, I will stop there and see what's on everybody's minds. And if you're gonna leave uh, right at, uh, I guess the debate's not till nine, right? Okay, all right, nobody leaves then. This is like, what does that mean? Nobody leaves the room. Okay, great. And I'm sorry we can't take questions online, but send me an email at jhillen at, at hsc.edu. I'll send you the slides and give you some thoughts on your question. Thoughts, comments? I've got a few questions, John. Uh, yes, yes, Matt, alumni Matt. Yeah, and we'll get that to you. Easier one first. Yeah. You podcasts you listen to. I also like listening to podcasts, but I heard someone say recently that podcasting equipment is getting too cheap. Everyone's got it. Everyone's mm. podcast. What are your podcasts you recommend to listen to to get just information on what's happening in the world and, and the impact of this? Yeah, so, um, and I'm biased because I have a couple of uh, friends or colleagues or associates in this. Um, for national security stuff, I would very much check out School of War. Let's tell me a fellow named Aaron McLean, former combat Marine. Went to St. John's College, you know, the Great Books Program in Annapolis, and then joined the Marines in a fit of patriotism after 9-11. Real intellectual, but he's also interesting and cool. So it's a cool podcast, like it's not egg heady. 
School of War, I think that's very good. Another one I like very much, which is a little broader view than just what I'll call the national security space, Peter Robinson out at the Hoover Institution has, who's the guy who wrote the Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall speech in 1987, a young speech writer in the Reagan White House. He's got a podcast called Uncommon Knowledge that I think is very good. Hoover also does one with H.R. McMaster, historian Neil Ferguson, and economist John Cochran called The Goodfellas. And to hear those three brains talk in conversation about the issues of the day to me is really interesting. My favorite podcast where I get to eavesdrop on a really interesting conversation between people I would die to be around. Right, so those are, those, are, those are some of my favorites. In terms of gathering news, I don't get much news from the podcast, but I do like to hear some of the opinions and thoughts. <laughs> yeah. The slide where you describe the four pillars of American mm -hmm. you mentioned that both candidates, there's some framing. Which of those four pillars would you be most concerned about American, American sort of losing influence in one of those four pillars? Uh, the, the military one, the last pillar. Yeah, um, we're, we're, definitely, we're definitely backing away. Look, this, is, this, this consensus was underpinned by a theory that more openness in the world, openness in systems, and, and obviously this didn't affect the whole world because in the meantime, part of the reason you had this consensus is the part of the world that we were influencing as opposed to the adversary, which was the Soviet Union and its you know, part of the world with a totally different political philosophy, totally different economic philosophy, right? But um, in general, people are, have soured on the idea that more liberalism leads to tremendous benefits for everybody. We're blaming free trade for having hollowed out the American manufacturing economy, okay? Uh, even though you could blame automation, automation has claimed like 80% of the manufacturing jobs, but we're blaming free trade, bad free trade deals, and that's part of Trump's appeal, the populist appeal. Um, we're blaming uh, open political systems for getting taken advantage of by people. And so that's just all fading. Um, but what we would not want to fade is our willingness to unapologetically um, use a strong military as a deterrent, first and foremost, and then in the event deterrence fails to protect U.S. national security interests. So uh, I, I worry about that because I, I like to, as a national security person, I like to play away games. I don't, I don't wanna play home games, I wanna play away games. Okay, and I think you need to be out there, forward deployed, shaping the environment. I would have not ended Afghanistan. I would have kept it at a low level, probably similar to what it was, because I want somebody there. I want somebody on the ground. I want somebody listening. I want somebody shaping. I want to be engaged, right? And you can be engaged in different ways, through diplomacy, through intelligence. It doesn't have to be with a bunch of boots on the ground. But I worry that that's the impulse I worry about. We've got to bring everybody home impulse. And I think this is a wrong time to be doing that, because once you're home, you can't see stuff. And I think that's difficult. I'm going to go to the back, and then we'll come up here. Yes, sir. Uh, um, so uh, with your bottom line, yeah. Uh, where do you think that punch will come from? And also, do you think our government down at the moment is that something that might happen with the election? Um, so where's the punch coming from and where's our guard at right now? Yeah, so um, I, I gave a talk at, at Alumni Weekend. It was called, If You Liked 1938, You're Gonna Love 2024. Um, I, I get called in to cheer up the alums on Alumni Weekend. Uh, it's always Saturday morning, so they're all hungover anyway, so everybody wants to be depressed. Um, but I was making three points. I said there's three swirling forces in 1938 that look a lot like today. One is there's these regional conflicts, right? We have Ukraine, Israel, and then the Cold War with China, and we're viewing them as three different things discreetly. But at any point in time, any one of them, let alone all three, could escalate and kind of come together. So that's trend that was happening in 1938 too. You had a war in the Mediterranean and Africa with Italy, yet Hitler was, you know, this time muscling his way but not shooting yet through Europe. You know, the Anschluss in Austria, the rearming of, you know, the rural valley, the Sudetenland and all that. And then you had Japan had already been at war in Asia, mostly with China, since the early 30s. So it's very similar. Second thing is, in 1938, the, uh, the, what became the Axis started cooperating with each other, and that is happening now. The, um, the degree of economic and military and intelligence and technology cooperation between Iran, Russia, and China, with a little bit of North Korea thrown in, is extraordinary. 
okay? And they all have the same goal, to expel the U.S. from the regions in which they want to have more domination and influence. So the goal of these people working together is antithetical to long-stated, and in some cases, you know, um, a U.S. doctrine, let alone U.S. interests. The third thing that's common is where's the American people's head? In 1938, it was, we don't, we don't want nothing to do with that stuff over there. Messy. We did that 20 years ago. It's the third, what's the third most costliest war in American history in terms of casualties? Well, what's okay. the third? The Civil War is the first. World War II is the second. What's the third costliest war in American history? Yeah, Vietnam? No. no. Yeah, it's World War I. 110,000, more than twice as many as Vietnam, right? People don't think about that, but that was very much in the mind of people in 1938, right? So, you go, so let's go to America today. I think Americans are in a little bit of a similar place. Some of the polling supports that, some of the polling, I'm on the board of the Reagan Institute, we've done some polling. Americans seem a little bit more forward-leaning, willing to, they want to be led, right? They want leadership. They want someone who has a plan, who has a vision, who has confidence in American power. I think both parties are showing a betrayal of confidence in American power. Um, you know, by, by, by saying, I'm not sure we can do this. I'm not sure we can solve this. Let's, let's get a little less engaged. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's, these are, that's what worries me. Not is a spark gonna fly here, but these, this confluence of events. Um, there's a commission, seven or eight very sober people. I know a bunch of them. Jane Harmon was the chairman, former congresswoman from uh, California Democrat, Republican Eric Edelman, Roger Zagan, friends I've worked with. It's called the National Defense Posture Committee. They just released a big report. And they say we are closer to World War III than any point in time. And the, the state, going back to your second question, the state of the US military is not remotely prepared to be able to shape that so it doesn't happen, let alone respond to it if it does. Now that's a very dire prediction. But John Pace reminds me there's no football on on Tuesday night, so I might as well just be a downer until we get football back on, <laughs> on, on, on some other night. But you asked what I worry about. Okay, and, and that's what I worry about, that confluence of events. Yes, sir. Um, former President um, uh, Trump <clears throat> sort of claims to have a magic wand yeah. that he can go in and stop wars right, and right, debt right. and such. Now, yeah. he had four years to stop the Afghanistan yeah. uh, war that uh, yeah. uh, he could have used that magic wand at any time during those four years and negotiated the end of the war um, with, with, with the Taliban, but leaving out the Afghanistan government right. that we worked with for 20, almost 20 years, right. whether, whether they were corrupt, and, which they were very right. corrupt and such. But uh, why did, first of all, why did he not use his magic wand right. and leave it in the next president's lap right. to be blamed right. for an imperfect? Yeah. Okay, is it easy? Is it, is it that easy to get out of a war yeah. without having some crazy person from uh, ISIS? Right. Come right. And blow people up? Yep. So, so the question is for the um, alums, you know, about. Uh, how easy it is to have a war, because we do have, and this is, candidates promise things, right? One of my challenges is, because anybody, this, there's this awful, dirty, four-letter word that was not mentioned in the presidential debate once, but if you read Paul Kennedy, he'd tell you it's one of the keys to a civilization surviving. Anybody know what that awful four-letter word is? It's a big problem for us, but nobody talks about it. Yeah. The debt, right? So the candidates are in promise mode. And both candidates have promised stuff that would really continue to have as many. And among the things they'll promise is the ability to be a peacemaker. It's a very attractive quality in a states, statesman or stateswoman. I can, I'm going to come in and make peace. Who doesn't want that person, right? Especially, we just passed a million people have been killed in Ukraine. We just passed that awful milestone, what Grant called the grim arithmetic of war. You know, we just passed that. And the Middle East, of course, is, is a mess. Um, but it's too hard. It, it's too hard. Uh, the other side gets a vote the adversary. The Taliban voted the way they voted um, in, in terms of the, the, the Trump administration's work in Afghan peace deal to pull it out. Trump very much wanted it. Remember, he, he called these endless wars and 
Biden called them forever wars. But both candidates were on the same sheet of music in 2020 about ending wars. But it's harder than it looks. And any candidate promising an end to the Ukraine or the, or the uh, Israel imbroglio is, is uh, I'd ask for the details. I think people have, they haven't shown much. It's very, very difficult. We're in, this is a nut, goes back to the concern. We're in some very thorny situations right now. People generally don't tend to stop fighting until their war aims are fulfilled or they have no capacity to wage war. They may pause for a while, but nobody's war aims are even close to being fulfilled on any of these sides in any of these conflicts. So we're in a tough spot. Yeah, Ward. There's a book called World Woman Ranked by a fellow named Dimitri Alperovich. Yeah. And his point is that we would like to have she as the leader of the world. Yeah. Is that something that you have thought about? It, do you think that that's possible, uh, given our debt and our situation? Yeah, so the question, and word asked really is, you know, can we, um, can we de continue to deter worst case scenarios? Okay, because we know the ambitions of our adversaries. Yeah, I think, I think it's possible. I think you have to be very determined and intentional about it. I was talking with the Alexander Hamilton Society, you guys at dinner, and I said, I said, if, if I were the Secretary of State, I would have my really smart people doing the normal business of diplomacy and strategy. And then I have my super smart people coming in every day. I would say, I want you to go out every morning. I want you to stand here and tell me, what did you do in the last 24 hours that made Z less likely to invade Taiwan, that made him question his capabilities, that reduced his uh, arsenal, that put him on the back foot, that confused him diplomatically. I just want his head in the wrong place, not leaning forward into it's time to take Taiwan before I leave the scene, which is something he's promised politically, right? I would want someone to stand in front of me every day with Iran and say, how did I put Iran, how did I knock them back a step over the last 24 hours? What did we do in the information world? What did we do in the diplomatic world? What did we do in the military world? What did we do in the intelligence world to denude their capabilities, to reduce their ambitions, to sow confusion and dissent in the plans they have for attacking our interests. That's where my smartest people would be, right? And, and they, because that's statecraft, okay? And I don't really think we're thinking that way. We've been tending to hit what I call the global snooze button. Problem crops up, hit the snooze button. Problem, oh, this is awful, a war. Everybody should cease fire, okay? That's not a policy. It can buy you some time, but it's not a policy because it doesn't, it only allows people who would benefit belligerents that would benefit most from a temporary ceasefire to benefit, but doesn't really move anything along towards a sustainable resolution. It, it's the default of a passive power that's not thinking energetically and creatively. Just say every day, even tonight, right? Iran lobbed, what, 100, over 100 ballistic missiles at uh, Israel tonight, shot down, most of them by coalition, apparently no casualties, but at the same time terrorist attack killed, I think, eight people last I heard on the news. In, uh, in Israel, and our immediate response was, everybody needs to stop fighting, okay? It's, uh, it's, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not an intentional, energetic, creative response. It can just buy you time. So that's what I, that's what I worry about, because I'd like to get to a situation where Z does wake up every morning and say, boy, I still have the political ambition to get Taiwan, but not today. Uh, in the unfortunately likely event of World War III starting. Uh, do you think that the United States is ready for the prospects of a third world war? Mm. Yeah, well, it depends, right? It's the only honest answer you get. It depends on, there'd be all these contingencies and conditionalities and everything. Um, let's look at historically. In 1939, our army was smaller than Portugal's. I think it was the 17th biggest army in the world, okay? I don't even know what the size of the Marine Corps was. Small. Uh, so we weren't prepared for World War II in your thing. Are we prepared for, yeah, I mean, we're a global superpower with a huge and enviable arsenal and incredible capabilities. Were the Israelis prepared to <clears throat> combat attacks on five different fronts? 
maybe, maybe not, right? Um, they perform some almost miracles in terms of intelligence uh, stuff over the past couple of weeks. Um, so I think you, you, you never really know. I, I think the art is to have a level of preparedness and a policy and a mindset, going back to candidates, that matches it with this intentionality and self-belief and confidence that you never get to that. Because you're deterring, you're shaping, you're cajoling, you're bullying, you're seducing, you're sweet talking, doing all these things simultaneously with an idea about what the world should look like and what role we play in the world. That's what I look for from a presidential candidate. I want to hear notes of that, even if they're far in the distance. I can hear the notes. When a presidential candidate, I can hear the notes. And those, those are the notes that I want to hear from somebody who's, who's got a plan to avoid that. Because then you are down to a kind of mathematical question of you know, do we have enough ships, do we have enough bombs, do we have enough kind of things. Yeah, right now we're not as prepared as we'd like to be for the worst scenarios. We're probably pretty prepared for the lesser scenarios. But who knows you know, what it'll be. Hope for the best, prepare for the worst. I, that's, that's a good strategy. Yes, sir. Could we see like the Twitter <laughs> punch come before the election while America is still so divided? Before like the new election, before we get a new president? Yeah, I suppose, you know, I suppose it's always possible, but I, I, I see the world so engaged and so wrapped up in its own toil in the various theaters that it, I, it's hard for me to see a country with a capability to do that outside of a, what I'll call a terrorist attack um, and what they might gain from it. Uh, I'm also a little instructed, but it's never happened in history. We've had a pre-election military type surprise. We tend to get surprises, but it's, they tend to be, oh, this, this Canada had a DUI they hid and you know, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so um, I'm not looking for it, but the best way to defend against it is to you know, be vigilant. Vigilant, it's a tough world. I'm gonna go here and then here. We'll see where we are. Uh, the Democratic Party has become increasingly divided over the issue of Israel and yeah. the war in Gaza. How do you think that would affect a potential terrorist presence? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be something she would have to deal with as president. Um, so uh, at the convention, that split in the Democratic Party, the more progressive wing, very much, you know, wanting the, 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 the uh, Palestinian perspective to be much more heard in the conversation and policies shaped differently as a result. That was really, and protesters were out on the street in Chicago, everybody expected, there was no chaos. There was no repeat of 1968. Um, and so, uh, they, the Democratic, there's an old joke, I, someone will remind me who said there's an old joke where a politician, a Democratic politician once said, um, I have never belonged to an organized political party, I'm a Democrat. Right, and that was his joke. He's a very famous Democratic leader. Someone's got to look up who, who said that. And, and so the Democratic Party used to have a reputation for uh, uh, being ill-disciplined, subject to passions. You see these things, but that, that super disciplined at that convention. She put out a very pro-Israeli message, showed she was uh, a human being who understood the, uh, you know, just, just the, the sheer the scale of the human destruction involved in and around the world, guys, and, and, and you know, bemoaned and lamented the loss of life in the conflict uh, among the Palestinians, but she didn't change policy at all, right? And, uh, but she's gonna have to deal with it. Um, I think it's one of the benefits for, uh, um, for a Trump presidency from his perspective is he he's doesn't have these built-in political, because he's his own party. Um, he, and he's created the party that's around him right now, but she's gonna have to deal with wings of the party that have different views about foreign policy than this kind of continuation of an Obama-Biden conventionality, I think. My question is, regardless of, regardless of whoever wins the election, what do you think is gonna be the most immediate challenge of the current tour? What do you think is going to be the most immediate concern? Yeah. Foreign policy part? So the quite, most immediate foreign policy thing to get on the president, they're, they're, they're already there, right? So it's already there. Um, there could be significant movement in the uh, Russo-Ukrainian war as well as in the Middle East between now and inauguration day, January 20th, perhaps somewhere around there. So whatever president comes in to office, the next day, I don't think their first meeting is going to be. They're going to gather the smartest people and say, "Let's talk about the marginal tax rates." 
I don't think that's going to be the first meeting. I think it's going to be the situation room and um, issues with what is our posture, what is our position, what's, how do we shape things on the ground, do we have the forces to do it, how do we, you know, re, how do we construct the tools that we need for the ambitions we have to get the things done when we get done, what could stand against us. That kind of strategy conversation, I think, is going to be, it's not all going to be crisis management. I think the Trump administration took advantage of a relatively peaceful world to pull back from the crisis management. They issued a very sound national security strategy. I say it was written by my friend H.R. McMaster, among others, but Matt Pottinger, his deputy, brilliant guy, friend, and uh, they had a very sober, sound national security strategy because they weren't trapped in crisis management. I'm not sure the next administration is going to have that luxury. I think they're just going to be managing crises for a while. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe two last questions. One is this, this young uh, freshman, is it? Freshman, okay. John Pace, freshman. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so there, there's opportunities that you mentioned that people around the world. Uh, America's adversaries are run by old and fundamentalist by their big mortal right. men, like Alan. What's in the diplomat's toolbox to think about shaping the future while we're dealing with the current? Yeah, it's a good question. So the question is about uh, adversarial regimes that I described before and their, their, their political systems. And they're autocratic surveillance states run by individuals or tight circles. Z's in a very super tight circle and he makes sure it stays tight because he purges everybody every couple of years in the good old fashioned way. And then um, I, I don't know if Putin has a successor, I don't know about it. And if he's identifying grooming, I don't think succession planning is a big exercise in these, in these places. Um, watch the movie Death of Stalin for an amusing uh, uh, take on that. But um, uh, so what's in the diplomat's toolbox to affect this? These autocratic surveillance states arrayed purposely, intentionally to harm U.S. interest um, and, and pretty boldly stating so. What can you do about it? Okay. We played with over the course of time um, democratizing these adversaries. Um, uh, we played with uh, fostering... Um, uh, opposition, you know, uh, and all that. We have a really mixed track record at how that works, a really mixed track record. In general, and Americans don't like to say this because we like to think we can, we never leave ourselves to fate, those things need to play themselves out. And I think the most the U.S. can do is, in, in, in with allies diplomatically, is set a bunch of incentives out there that encourage the playing out of that at a faster pace by the people who are playing it. So in other words, the people of China, the people of Russia, the people of Iran, you know, how can we encourage that natural replacement cycle to, to take place in a way that is not more destabilizing than, than the current regime? And that is such an imprecise set of calculations. So I think you just do your best. I'm, I'm sad that after the Cold War, we lost a lot of these capabilities, we shut down um, U.S. Information Agency, which, which wasn't there to just help people, it was there to be an organ for ideas and to inspire uh, resistance movements, opposition movements in autocratic states and so on and so on. We've lost a lot of those capabilities. Um, ironically, in a world in which you can make a living as an influencer, I still don't even know what that is actually, um, but it, people tell me you make a decent living as an influencer online, we've lost the tools of influencing people in, in the world of ideas. So if we could build those back, we might have a little more sense. But I'm very struck by, in particular in Iran, our inability. Iran's got this huge mass of middle class, education, worldly, um, um, non-mullah oriented people. Energetic, creative, uh, oriented, knowledgeable about the outside world and we've never been able to get or help or help them see their own way to mobilizing that since 1979 against a very unpopular theocratic um, authoritarian regime you know run, run by the mullahs so i'm very humbled by our ability to push on that calculus but it doesn't mean we shouldn't try maybe one last thought who had somebody oh yes so from a deterrence perspective and just military capabilities it seems to me that Naval forces are the hardest to build up quickly. 
Yeah. And does either candidate or their party think seriously about that or have yeah. plans in place to enhance our shipbuilding capabilities or the defense industrial base in general? Yeah, so we're not in a good state here, as you know, better than anybody. The end of the Reagan administration, they never quite got 600 ships, they're around 590. But then there's a lot of three card Monty in, in that counting too. But we're down to just under 300 now, I think, somewhere around there. 225 operational. 225 operational. And the, the Trump defense plan is to get to 355 or something along those lines with a massive defense buildup, investment in particular in this area. And it's not just hulls in the water, it's having the capabilities to have our own shipyards. I mean, we only have like two, three functioning shipyards for, for uh, naval vessels now um, and so on. So it's all the infrastructure, building out all the infrastructure. Um, but this is a 2050 or 2060 thing. The Navy has a terrific plan for beating China and, and defending Taiwan, okay? And they're gonna get the Navy they need for this plan in like 2048, right? So I'm really hoping, I'd like the courtesy from the CCP to wait until we're ready, <laughs> right? So the world doesn't work that way, of course. So um, it's, it's not just, it's, it's gotta be, I guess my point here is, I take a candidate seriously who's talking about a sustained buildup, right? It can't be a one year blip in the budget. When she was a senator, because she was a progressive senator from California, that's what you have to be to survive politically. So I'm not blaming it on her. Senator Harris said in 2020 that the defense budget needs to be cut and that money needs to be redistributed to urgent communities for social needs, okay? I like to see a candidate come out and tell the American people the difference between guns versus butter and the different legal pots of money and the different types of money and how the investment in one tends to lead to more investment in the other and paint that connection. I think the last president who did that was Reagan or he gave a speech in the Oval Office read charts up and he pointed to the charts. Like a nighttime speech, I'm, I'm here to interrupt friends or happy days, whatever the show was at the time, to tell you about domestic versus foreign policy spending. That argument's not really being made. Um, so yeah, I, would I like to see more investment um, but I think, I think candidates are really gonna struggle to get there. And I think you're gonna see a Navy about the same size as it is for a long while. And, and that's gonna, it's already hurting us. I don't think we have a carrier in the Pacific right now. I don't know, I have to find I, it. Yeah, I got pulled out uh, to replace the carrier in the um, Gulf. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the, the operating tempo is so high in the Mediterranean, the Red Sea, and the Persian Gulf that we say the pacing threat, the big adversary, the one who must be deterred is China. We don't have a single carrier. In the, uh, in the Pacific. So we're not, we're not walking the walk. It's also a manpower issue. Not yeah. Goals. yeah, yeah, the Navy just did barely. But this is another thing, I mean, the, the Army missed by 10,000 two years ago and more, so yeah. Yeah, the, the military is due a rebuilding, which, oh, by the way, the military spending still, I mean, we're gonna have a trillion dollar defense budget, but we're also gonna pay this, you're, the same amount on the national debt next year. So you're gonna be paying for two Pentagons, but you only get one because uh, the rest is interest on the debt. So that's, that's probably gonna be the second meeting at the White House for the new president. Does someone walk me through this budget mess? Because it's hard. Um, neither candidate has shown an instinct to talk about that on the campaign trail because it's a grown-up conversation. I think Americans can take grown-up conversations. You know, let, let's talk about trade-offs. Let's talk about stuff we can't have. Let's talk about making priorities. I think Americans can endure a grown-up conversation. Candidates don't want to have it. They just want to like that, just help them get promise that. Exactly. It never helps anybody get reelected. This is the vote for me, sixth grade, I've got all the best candy kind of election. That's what it feels like to me in, in some ways. I'd like to see a more seriousness, but maybe I'm asking for too much from elected politicians. Any last thoughts before we close out? Uh, well, oh, hang on one second, I just see if we can get someone who hasn't had a chance to speak yet, just to share the love. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I'm curious, do you think there's any like country in like the distant future yeah. that the, uh, America is going to need to worry about, like becoming like a yeah. superpower or a contingent? Yeah. No, I'm glad you asked that. I was to end on a really optimistic note. So I, I study competitive strategy. I'm a competitive strategist, right? I love our position in the world, despite all this turmoil I've talked about, right? We've got these two big oceans. We've got these two friendly land borders. That's really unusual condition geopolitically for a great power, historically. We're an energy superpower. We became a net energy exporter in 2019. 
We're the world's biggest energy superpower. We don't always use it that way, but we are. Okay. Um, we have a couple of secret weapons nobody else can copy. A creative, privately funded, innovative private sector economy. Seven of the ten biggest tech companies in the world are American. The other three are Chinese and government owned. Not a single European one in there. Right? Um, we have a liquid capital markets, the key to economic success, one of the pillars of Alexander Hamilton's thinking. Um, by the way, in 2008, the Eurozone and the US economically were the same size. We were the same size as Europe economically. We are 80% bigger than the Eurozone now. I saw this article in Le Mans. The French were like, we can't, what happened? It's this article in Le Mans. The French go, we can't happen. We turned around and the US is 80% bigger than us. We were equals. China was forecast to pass us and catch us in various measures of economic and national strength by like 2030. That's pu push that back to 2050, 2080 now. They're slowing down. I love our competitive position, which is why I'm keen for us and our presidential candidates and our congressional leaders and everybody else to understand that, the gra that they get to work with something great there's a gravity to how you play your hand in the world. You've got to play it in a sober and prudent and active and energetic way to get the most out of it. And if you do that the right way, I don't see any peer competitors or threats coming on board other than the, you know, the, you know, nuclear proliferation and terrorism and, and all the rest of it. We're in a very enviable position. A Chinese strategist would switch places with us in a minute. They would love to be, right? We don't always think that way, and we should. It would give us more confidence in our own exertion of our own policy. Okay, thanks very much, guys. Thanks, alums online. Appreciate you guys having me here tonight. Great, thank you.